That's one of the things that we looked at last week. And tonight we're going to be looking at as Paul is going to talk to them about this persevering. But also, but along with persevering, there's always some opposition with that, right? There's always the, the enemy that wants to come against this perseverance that makes it more of a struggle. It makes it hard. And we know that perseverance comes through prayer. That's one of the things that we're going to look at tonight. But James starts out in chapter 5, and he's talking to the non-believers that might be present there at the synagogue. There might be some problems that are going on with those in authority, the bosses, the hefes, those that have the companies, those that maybe even the governing officials that might be there listening. Because the first thing he opens up with is he says, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Because obviously there were some things going on with the authority here. They were mishandling their workers. You know, that was, and this is what, this is what James is going to talk about these people on how to persevere through being treated like this. Going through this problem, going through these difficulties, because it is hard. Some of us work in places where the boss is really strict, very mean, right? Maybe we are working with co-workers who know that we are believers, who know that we are Christians, and they give us a hard time, right? Many of us have friends and families who don't understand what it is to be a Christian, and rather than to come along with us, be on the same page as us, they're sometimes divisive and against us. They call us Bible thumpers, right? So first thing that James is going to do as he enters into chapter 5 is he addresses the rich. And not just the rich believers, but the rich unbelievers. He says, weep and hell for your miseries are coming upon you. Because there's going to come a day where they're going to have to answer for how they've been treating their employees. And we're going to see here that they were holding back wages. They were mistreating them. And the proof was in the money or in their possessions or in the food that they were attaining and retaining. You know, the Bible talked about the man that was building bigger barns so that he could hold more of his stuff in. But James says here, Come now, you rich, weep in hell for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, in a way that we can understand you. That we would lead differently. That we would understand what it means to persevere through situations and problems and difficulties. Whether it be with our overseers, our bosses. Whether it be with our family members. Whether it be with our spouse. I don't know, Lord. We are all under this affliction because we're all in this world. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us in a way that we can understand and leave here differently. Lord, we pray for those again that are here for the first time, and we ask that you would make yourself evident, evident to them, that they would see you in everything that is spoken about here tonight. So we thank you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So James is telling these people these rich people, to go ahead and start mourning and howling. And that means to wail. That means to make noise. Because we know that the outcome, again, we talked about how Jesus, through the work of the cross, how God is going to prevail. All those that live a life apart from God are going to answer for how they live their lives one day, right? We all know that the rapture is going to be happening at times. And James is going to make reference to the rapture, to the time that God comes back for their children. But he uses three of the references. He says your riches are corrupted. You know, your garments are eaten. And your gold and silver are corroded. You know, back then, you know, some of the things that they depended on a lot was the food. You know, the, the, the grain, the, the wheat, the corn. And he's saying that these things that you hold so precious are of no use to you. You know, yeah, this word cro this word corroded means that it is, or this root, the corrupted means that it's rotten. All these barn houses that you're building to hold all your grains and stuff are in there. You're not utilizing it for your people that you that work for you, and they're starting starting to rot. And the the word garments are that are moth eaten. You know, he makes reference to the things that the material things. You know, the things that we buy, the things that are shiny for a while. You know, eventually we lose interest on it and we just put it back in the garage or whatever. 
You know, he says that eventually these things are going to become worthless. They're going to rust. They're not going to be as shiny as they were when we first bought them. But he says, your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. The, the gold and the silver are the monies that they sort of hoarded in by not paying their employees, by not giving to those that mow their fields, it says. All these things are coming to nothing. They're useless. And because of that corrosion, which means to rust, it's not of any use to them, is a witness against them. This is proof that this, these things that you have gathered up are of no benefit to you, and they're sort of just slipping away. But he says that they're a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire, just as they are rusting and corroding and sort of vanishing. These people that have hold such a high trust for their money and their wealth and their bank accounts, and just as it is failing them, they're failing themselves also. They're deteriorating. And when you look at some of the uh, things that have happened in past, you know, the, the, the stock markets, Wall Street, and whenever there's a big collapse, you see of all the people that have held such a strong interest in those things and have placed their lives into those things. And some of the times, you know, when the market crashes, there are people that really, they crash along with it. Their lives are over. You know, they feel that everything is lost, it's worthless. And some people do harm to themselves when they experience situations like that. And this is what he's saying. He said, you guys may, might as well just weep in hell right now because this is what's going to happen. The things that you've accumulated are not going to be of any use to you. He says, it's going to consume your flesh like fire. Now, when he used the word corroded, he, mean, he, he meant rust. You know, these things are rusting. But when he says that they're going to consume you like fire, it's going to consume you even quicker because James talked about the spark that ignited a forest fire and how quickly a fire moves. He says, it's going to corrode you like fire. It's going to move upon you very quickly. He says, you have heaped up treasure in the last days. You know, Jesus talked about those things that we reap, those things that we heap up, you know, the things that... We, Jesus says, wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And that we should be looking at building up our treasures in heaven, right? Not here on earth where moth eat it and, and, uh, and rust gets to it and thieves get to it. But he's telling these people that they keep up treasure here in the last days. And James is making a allude that, hey, God is coming soon. You know, what are we doing with our time? Are we so concerned about the things that we have that we've lost all sight of everything else and we're gathering all these things for ourselves? He says, eventually those things are going to fail you. You know, I like what Luke says, you know, when the, the rich young ruler that asked Jesus, you know, what, what must I do to attain heaven, you know, to inherit the kingdom of God? And, you know, Jesus says, well, these are the things, you know, that shall not commit adultery, that shall not steal, covet, lie, and all these things. And the, and the rich young ruler said, hey, you know, I, I've kept those. I've, I've kept those, those laws. And so Jesus says, well, there's one thing you lack. He goes, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And it said that that young ruler went home sad because he had a lot of money. Well, this is the same thing here. God is coming back soon. Why build bigger barns? Why hoard up all this stuff? And this is what James is saying, because he's saying that eventually these people who are treating you in a, in a way like this, eventually everybody's going to answer. So he's giving even those that are poor and those that are workers a little bit of hope that one day everything is going to be settled in the end. And he says in verse 4, he says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth. He doesn't use the word Sabbath, you know, like we would know as Sabbath or Saturday, or what we would consider Sunday. But this word Sabaoth is more of the Lord of Armies. This is the, 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 the Lord of armies, the, the host of armies. This is letting the rich know that one of these days, that this guy who's going to be all suited up in armor is coming, out, coming after them. But he says that they're guilty of, hoarding, of holding back wages of their laborers. These people who are, you know, gleaning the fields, pulling the wheat, whatever work that took place back there, the people that own these Farms are holding back the money by fraud. You know, the Bible also talks about not giving a man his wages. You know, sending him home after he works. When this, these poor people, this is all that they depended upon. This is all that they had. 
you know, to be able to go home and to, to, to feed their families. And so he says, he kind of, he's winding it up with the rich people in five, chapter 5, verse 5. He says, you have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury or in wanton. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. These rich people, they've lived these extravagant lives. You know, we hear the story about, you know, the, uh, you know, Lazarus and the rich man. You know, Lazarus was, uh, it was the, the, the guy that was at the, at the foot of the table. The rich man would allow him to eat some of the crumbs that fell off his table. But in the same way, you know, the Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham where he was comforted. The rich man, it doesn't say that he was a bad man, but maybe because of his riches and because of the way he handled it, not giving to somebody who was in need. You know, the Bible says those that have and don't give, you know, are guilty of sin. You know, because again, James is talking about those that, you know, that way of life that we should be living. Because in verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such a such a city and spend a year there. He says, you know, we should be more concerned about what we're going to do with our day rather than, again, looking to see how we can uh, accumulate more things. We should be looking at the welfare of others. So James says in verse 5 that here on earth during their lifetime, they have just lived in pleasure. Rather, you know, fattened their own hearts, you know, cared for their own needs rather, rather than the needs of others. In verse 6, he says, you have condemned, you have murdered the just man. He does not resist you. He says, you have treated them with condemnation. You have judged them in one way or another. You know, the Bible talks about that we shouldn't be those that judge another brother or sister. Because, hey, we're all, you know, under, under the authority of God. And we are all servants of God. And so in a sense, we shouldn't be judging another man's servant, you know. Or, or else we're going to be judged in the same way or the same manner. But he says you have murder, you know, holding back wages, allowing somebody to go home to their family without the money that was intended for them and that they deserve is sort of like committing murder. You know, for some of the families who didn't have enough money to buy food, who knows what, what was taking place. Maybe people were dying because they didn't have the needs that they, that they, that, you know, that they were supposed to have, that they hadn't worked for. But he says you had murdered the just man. And, I, and I, the, the book of Acts speaks of the just man as the Holy Spirit. You know, and also uh, the Bible talks about Stephen and even James. He, his nickname was James the Just. You know, so those people that are doing the work of God, those that are considered just, those are, you know, in a sense, believers or Christian. He says you have murdered those people. He says, but he does not resist you. At this point, they may feel as though they're getting away with it. He is that capital H. God is not resisting you right now. But he says there's going to come a time, you know, when the Lord is going to be here, he's going to set things straight. And we as believers, as we feel this persecution, should be those that desire to do things on our own. We should remember that God's promises are in here for us. Even though we may face persecution, that we should persevere through here through this, and James is going to give illustration on how to do this. So here he gives the answer, in a sense. So James says in verse 7, he says, therefore, he says, be patient, brethren. Now he's changing his focus to the believer again. He was talking to the non-believer, you know. But I think he spoke to them. I believe he spoke to them in a way so that they would understand what's coming, and that the poor... And those that were believers would see that there is going to come a time, you know, not, not, not to be so worried about it. Yeah, you know, it's tough when you're being persecuted. It's tough when you're going through a tough time, when somebody is on you, you know, when you, especially when you don't deserve it. Many times we deserve it. But here when we don't deserve it, it is pretty time. It, it, it's tough. It's, it, it's hard to be patient. And this patient that he talks about is being more of long suffering, not just being patient, waiting for your you know, your water to boil so you can throw your spaghetti in there. You know, because that's not the patience that he's talking about here, but he's talking about being patient towards others, being long-suffering, being those that are slow to boil, slow to get angry, being able to, you know, in a, in a sense, look at your brother or your sister and realize that, hey, you know what? I love them. You know, though they may do, be doing something that I don't really think is right, you know, 
Long suffering is dealing with that, esteeming others higher than yourselves. And when you think about it, it's like, well, why would I look to somebody else and want to seek their welfare rather, rather than my own? And when we think about that, we have to remember that God is the same way with us. We have done things that are terrible, right? I know I have. I've done some things that, that, are, that, that you know, I should be judged for. But here, God, the example, has been long-suffering toward, towards us, and we should be that same way to others. But he says, be patient, you know, until the coming of the Lord. So he's not saying, just let's just be patient for the time being. He says, let's be patient for the, this is, this is for the long haul. This is, you know, sometimes we start out strong, you know, a week passes, two weeks, a month, a year, and pretty soon we're back doing, living the same way we used to. But here he says, until the coming of the Lord. And that's tough, being patient with somebody who is very afflicting, who is doing things that are hurting us. But we have to understand that even back then in the days, there was some persecution going on with the believers and the Christians. They had just gotten done nailing Jesus to the cross. You can only imagine what they wanted to do with the rest of the disciples. There's some big persecution going on. Right now, we have a little bit of luxury and freedom as believers, right? We're able to come to church. We're able to congregate here. We're able to, I'm able to pull out a Bible and we're able to learn from it and not have to hide you know, there are some countries right now where you, man, it's tough. You're in China. You, your life could be on the line. You know, and for some of you who might be here for the first time, this is a privilege that we have to be able to study and to learn God's Word because this is the only thing that's going to give us the freedom that we need. At this time of our lives, well, some of us might not want this type of freedom because we think freedom is doing the bad things, doing things that I want to do. Going out there, living the party life, hanging out with people that I should be hanging out with, hanging out at the Golden Goose or the Rusty Pelican or these places that we should be at, you know, hanging out in the garages with our friends. And we think that that's freedom. And for some of you who are younger will grow up and realize that was bondage. What I thought was freedom when I was 14 till I was 34 years old, I realized that that was bondage. I was enslaved to drugs. I was enslaved to a promiscuous lifestyle. I was enslaved to alcohol and all the other garbage that comes along with it. I didn't realize that I was a slave rather than a free person. And so this freedom that we, that we desire to have only comes through the freedom of the Bible that it gives, that, that God gives us. And so therefore, James is saying, be patient, brother. Come on, guys. This is be patient. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I hey, there's people over there with a, with, a, with a heavy thumb or a heavy hand on our backs. But be patient until the coming of the Lord. Let's be in it for the long haul. James says in, in, in the latter part of uh, 7, he says, Therefore, be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord. And then he gives an illustration, just as James always does. You know, he's always talking about the, the, the two men that come into the synagogue. One's, one's dressed really nice. One's all tore up. He gives the illustration of, you know, the, those that are lacking food. And, you know, this is what faith looks like. He, talk, he gives great illustrations. And here he gives another illustration. Because these people, back in the day, they must have all been, you know, they, they didn't have markets like we have. You know, we want to sell it. We go to the store. And we grab some a head of lettuce or tomato or whatever. But here back there, they, they, they would understand what James is going to say here. Because he says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. So here as he's speaking to these people, he realizes that these people are growing their own food. Their own wheat, their own corn. You know, their own... Carabasa and tomates, you know, he's, he, they're growing their own stuff. So they're going to understand this illustration that he's talking to them. And for some of us who have grown any type of vegetables, know that they don't just put the seeds in the ground and the next morning they wake up and they go, all right, I'm going to go make my salad, right? It doesn't happen like that, right? Well, back then it didn't either. They, <laughs> they planted their vineyards, they planted their farms, and it took patience. It took perseverance. It was tough. Maybe there was lack of rain. Maybe there was bugs. Maybe there was things. There was weeds that were growing. Right? It wasn't easy. And that's why he gives that illustration. Because it was hard work. It's difficult as we live our lives. At times. 
to be patient and to be persevering. And some of us are right here, we're sitting here this right now, tonight, and we're wondering, you know, how long is this going to go? You know? But the fact is that even the farmers, and he's given this illustration, it says that the, the farmer waits for its precious fruit. Because again, this vegetable, this vineyard, is what he was going to depend on. It was precious to them. And I like the word that the, that the uh, King James Version uses. He uses the word husbandman. You know, and it reminds me of the farmer, Jesus, God, the husbandman, waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. Waiting for us, waiting for our maturity. Even he's patient, right? Because some of us aren't walking the way we should right now. Some of us aren't living the lives that we should right now. But he's very patient. He's very long-suffering, right? He's hanging, he's hanging in there. And this is the illustration. This is the example that we should be. Waiting patiently until it receives the early and latter rain. And we know that the early rain is normally the rain that comes in November or December. And that's when the people would start getting the, 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 the ground plowed up and getting the seeds, getting the seeds planted. That would start the beginning of the germination. So he speaks of how important, you know, waiting for the early rain, but even the latter rain too. That came right about, not harvest time, but it came around May, April or May. That last bit of rain that sort of continued on the maturity of the fruit or whatever was growing. So he says, hey, let, let, let's wait. The, he points out to the harvest farmer, you know, that it does take work. It does take time. It does take patience. But waiting for that early and the latter rain. He says in verse 8, he says in 5 eight, he says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Again, he's talking about the Lord is at hand. The Lord is right there. The Lord, the Lord is at hand. He's come. He could come tonight. You know, are we living our lives as though he could actually be coming to that? And even back then, they're living for the expectancy of Christ, even back then. But he says, you also be patient. Established. I like this word established that he uses. It, it means to strengthen. It means to, to fix, to make fast, to make firm, to make secure. Make Fast, make strength, strengthen your hearts in faith. Strengthen your hearts in patience. And how do we do that? Right? How do we do that? How do we strengthen our faith? How do we establish our lives, our hearts? Right here. The Word of God. For some of us who are still a little bit like, oh, topsy turvy, and this is going on, and that's going, I haven't really established my faith, I really haven't established my life in Christ. And some of the questions I may ask them is, are you in the Word? Well, you know, I, well, you know, yeah, you know, you get the he and the haws, and well, you know, well, I don't have too much time. I got to work. I got this. I got to do. I got kids. No, 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 no. You have to be in the Word of God. You have to be in the Word daily. You have to be in prayer. You have to be in fellowship. That's how your heart. That's how your faith. That's how you're going to establish these things in Christ. We can't be those that are just so busy that oh, we just don't have time for that. You know, besides I gotta get caught up on my, you know, my, my shows at night, you know, my Netflix and whatever it might be that's consuming our time. I'm not saying that's the way it is with all of us. But there's so many times in our day that we can pull out the Bible and we can establish our hearts as Paul is, as James is saying here. Because it means to strengthen our hearts. To be patient and have courage that comes by trusting in God. The only way we can trust in God is we need to know Him, right? How do you trust something that you don't know? I mean, that takes a lot of faith. I mean, yes, it takes faith in believing in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but it takes more faith if you don't even know anything about them. So here, in order to establish your hearts, he says, establish your heart. That's the core of our body. Not our minds. We're not just reading this so that we can establish our mind, our knowledge of the word. But we need to have it right here. David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that what? That I won't sin against you. That's establishing your heart to a point where it's going to benefit you and your future. And as he mentioned, the coming of the Lord again. You know, that's, again, the second time. 
and pointing them to the end of time because it is at the end of time. The reward comes at the end of time. Again, being patient, knowing that even though they're living in this tribulation during this time, that the end is coming, everything's going to be settled at that time. In James 9, 5, 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Don't grumble against each other. He had said something about this the same way in, in, in the last chapter, in chapter 4, verse 11. He says, don't speak evil with one another. He was talking about not judging other people, you know, not speaking evil about them. But here it says, don't grumble against one another, brethren. You know, this word grumble means to sort of groan, complain. You know how easy it is, especially when somebody is treating you the way that they were treating them. It's easy to complain about the boss. You know, you come home and it's like, oh, honey, you can't, you won't believe what happened. You know, James is saying, don't do that. You know, this same judgment that you're passing on somebody else, even if it is your boss, he says, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be, it's going to be measured out to you in that same way, the Bible says. Whatever judgment, whatever mercy that you give. So he says, don't grumble against one another, lest you be condemned or lest you be judged also. Because he says, behold, the judge is standing at the door. God is standing right there. You know, it's like, it's like being at the, at, 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 you, you, for some of you who have kids, you know, you're, you know, you have, they might be sharing a room or something. And you, you know, you're there at the door. It's nighttime. They, sh they should be sleeping. And you can hear them if they're complaining or grumbling or, you know, fighting with one another. We know that God is everywhere at, at all times. He knows what's going on even in our mind and our thoughts. We might not be outwardly complaining or fighting with our brothers or sisters, but it might be in our heart. It might be in our thoughts. It might be in our mind. The Bible says that God is right there. He's at the gates. That's how close it is. God could come, like I said before, God could come back at any time. But the thing is, He is there at the door. He hears what we're saying. He sees what we're doing. And He hears what we're thinking. Because he's right there, just like when you're listening to the kids, are they behaving? You know what I mean? Just like the bosses sometimes, making sure you're not on Facebook, but you're working, right? Well, the boss is there at the gate. He sees us. He knows what's going on. So James is saying, be patient, because he also sees the bad that's going on in our, you know, against us. And that's what he's talking about, it. persevering. Hey, guys, be strong. Hey, I know, I, I see it. The, you know, the boss just cut your hours again, and he's doing it because of this or that or the other. Oh, yeah, they just cut your face. Don't worry about it. Be patient. Don't grumble. Don't go home and start fighting with the wife and the kids and kicking the dog around. Don't do that, please. Be patient. I see what's going on. I understand. It hurts. I hear your groaning. I hear your complaining. It's just like the, those that were being held back their wages. Their cries were coming up to the Lord. I hear it. I understand it. Don't worry. One day I'm coming back. So soon I'm at the door right now. I'm getting ready to come. Just be patient. And that's what he's, that's what he's telling them. That's what James is telling them, these, these that are being persecuted. The judge is standing right at the door because they are living in the last days. That's what Paul is saying here. So let's be willing to let him be our avenger. God is the one that's going to do that. You know, you know he's the one that, you know, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of them. There's nothing that we need to do that he can't do that's better, right? And I, and, I, and I don't mean by just hoping that they do. I hope God just knocks their teeth right out. No, I, we, we don't want to be, have a heart like that. But just as, as he said in the beginning, you know, howl and wail and mourn. And who knows that maybe the Lord might hear those cries as being, um, you know, just genuine. Maybe they're sorry for what they're doing. Maybe this is an opportunity to be a witness to your boss or be a, be a witness to somebody who's hurting you. As you are taking it patient, patiently, as you're persevering, you might say, what's different about my worker here, man? I've been doing everything to them, and they're not even upset. What did they know that I don't know? And then the worker says, well, you know, he's at the door. He's right there. You guys better get things in order. So that might be a good witness. So James says in 510, he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. And I know many of us have read the Bible and we've all read the story of Job, right? And, um, you know, he was that perfect, blameless, in a sense, man, you know, who Satan was like, you know, that when Jesus sees Satan roaming around to and fro, you know, God says, have you, you know, observed my, 
my, my, my servant Job. And Satan goes, well, of course he's going to serve you. Of course he loves you because you've given him everything. And Job was, you know, one that did have a lot. Had a lot of stuff, you know, good family, loved the Lord, riches. Said he had all kinds of cattle and stuff. But God says, well, tell you what, you can afflict him, you know, not to the point of death, but just removing everything that you think that's keeping him from loving you. And Satan does that. And Job loses all of his belongings, his family. And still, he's not trusting the Lord. So Satan says, well, you know, he still has his health. And God says, well, go ahead and, you know, take him to the brink of death, but don't kill him. Right? And so, and, and, and you're thinking, well, man, you know, I hope the Lord doesn't do something like that with me, you know, because that would be pretty tough. But here, he did it for a purpose. It says, you know, he says, he, he says look at the example of the suffering and the patience of this man, Job. He says in verse 11, he says, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. So there was something that the Lord was doing through all this. Not only was it for us, but it was for them back then, you know, for his whole family, for his wife and the, his three friends that came along and tried to comfort him. They weren't very comforting, but they came along and more or less told him, hey, you're obviously in sin. You're obviously being doing something wrong. You just need to admit it. You need to confess it and get on with your life. And he's like, you know, there's a few things that he was wrestling about. You got to read the story. It's a good story. But there was something that was intended by the Lord. And it was to show that he was very compassionate and merciful, as it says in verse 11. Because, again, we know the end of the story. We know how Job never turned his back on the Lord. We know that through this problem of losing his kids, losing all his household servants, all his farms and his animals and livestock, everything gone. Again, when you think about those who have lost a lot and how bitter, and how bitter it's easy to become. Job, you think, man, he, if he got really angry with the Lord, no, you know, but he didn't. Because there was a, a, a lesson to be learned here. And God knew it. God knew that someday we would be reading that same story of Job. And that we would see how he was persevered, how he persevered, how his hope, how his faith was established. It was established in his heart. And he realized that, hey, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I'm still going to serve. I'm still going to love the Lord. He had some questions to God, but he never turned his back on him. Because again, it's not how we start the race. It's how we finish it. It was a little bit rough for Job at the beginning. You know, there are many people that profess to know Christ and have started that run. But again, as we said earlier, you know, as soon as the problems come, as soon as the persecution comes, they sort of step away from the walk that they had with the Lord. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. It speaks of the person that, hey, you know what, no matter how rough it gets, wavering means not to be tossed to and fro from the situation in our life. And many, many of us have been... Some, some tough things have happened, right? Some bad things have, have, gone, have taken place. Things haven't gone exactly the way we would have them. But here the writer of Hebrews says, hey, man, hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering, without teetering, without tottering, without, you know, turning back. For he who promises is faithful. God is faithful. You know, the Bible says that he will never leave us, nor forsake us, and it's true. We might feel as though He's not around or he's gone, especially when we're feeling the heat. But we need to remember that he's right there in the midst. And the reason why he's allowing it to happen is the same way. Because there's something that's intended of the Lord. God wants to build you up. God wants to strengthen you. And the only way to happen, the only way for that to happen is for that little bit of a storm to take place. Now, I'm not talking about the things that we do wrong and we face some problems and, you know, situations. But I'm talking about the ones that do everything that we are supposed to do. And yet we still face that persecution. When you cry out to the Lord, He's hearing it. It's not going on deaf ears. He hears you, even though it might not seem like it. He not only hears it, but He's there with you. 
James 5.10, or we went, we looked at that. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Again, we know how it ended with Job. In Job chapter 42, <coughs> verses 1 through 2, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Everything that God intended to take place in Job's life was ultimately taken care of. He says, I have heard of you by your hearing of ear, but now my eyes see you. You know, we might not experience God's work in our lives right now. It might be all within the, you know, these pages of this book. But eventually, like Job says, it wasn't just hearing by his ear, but now it was seeing because of what took place at the end of this situation with Job. He says, in all my trials, God, I have seen what you are really like. People who have suffered and have not become bitter, but have endured, are people that really know God more intimately. And that was Job, realizing who God was. Job 42, chapter 6 says, Therefore I reacted, and I repent in dust and ashes. You know, because Job did say a few things that he shouldn't have said. Some of the questions, he says, I uttered things that I didn't even understand, you know. Some of the questions I did ask God, and God ultimately said, hey, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I put all these, you know, the, these uh, planets in, in space? Where were you when I created man and beast and everything? And so Job realized, wait a second, I shouldn't be asking any questions to God. I should be answering the questions that he might have for me. So he says, therefore I reacted and I repented in dust and ashes. But the last thing Job did was that he prayed for his friends. Even those that were against him. It says in chapter 42, 42, verse 10 and 12, he says, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job. The Lord gave him back everything that he had lost, plus double, it says. When he prayed for his, it says, he, all, all that he lost, he says, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. Then the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. You see, God had a plan all along. And God has a plan all along for us. Even though we feel as though we have nothing anymore, or everything's just sort of dissipated, it's gone. Realize that God is still working in our lives. And whatever He's intended to do within us, He's going to do and He's going to complete. Whatever God has started, the Bible says, in our lives, that He's going to complete it. In the latter days, our ending is going to be much better than the beginning. Right? Whatever, whatever's going on in our lives, hey, guess what? Tomorrow's always better in Christ. As long as we're walking, we're doing what we're, we're called to do, every day seems to get better. Because I know today is much better than the day that I first gave my life over to the Lord. Because I was still messed up during that time. <laughs> and so if you're in that progression, if you're in that state of moving forward towards Christ, then you're in the right place. But be careful that you're not progressing. Be careful that, you're, that you could be stagnant or regressing. So from the beginning to the end of James, James is talking about real faith. This real faith is a genuine faith that makes itself and works. That faith it takes to be, to be um, persevering, to be trusting in the Lord. So now, in verse 13, he now calls us to commune with God, to pray. So we're going to look at, we're going to skip verse 12, but we're going to get to verse 13. He says, is, any, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders, for the church, of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So here, after perseverance, he talks about prayer. And we know that prayer, prayer and perseverance go hand in hand. Because sometimes we need to really pray to be patient, right? We need to pray to be long-suffering. But here he says, if anyone is suffering, he's talking about those who are suffering affliction. Those who are being persecuted. Those who are going through some tough times. Those who are suffering calamity. He says, let them pray. You know, one of the things that we need to do first and foremost is to pray. The first thing we want to do is go talk to someone about this. Or go talk to that person about that. Or we need to make the phone call. But James says, let him pray. If we're experiencing the suffering and calamity, we are, to, we are to communicate with God. That's what He wants. God understands our life better than anybody else can. Who can give us the, the best type of counsel but the Lord, right? So He says, let Him pray. 
He says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. And so again, even if everything's going right in our lives, right? We got a few bucks in the bank, the rent's been paid, our health is good, the kids are doing fine, right? Everything's cheerful, everything's honky-dory. He says, sing songs. You know, sing. Because as you're singing, what you're doing is you're praising God. You're giving thanks in a sense for what He's done, for what He's accomplishing in your life. But you can also, vice versa, crisscross these things. Even if you're suffering, you can sing songs, right? Sometimes we don't know how to pray, right? But we remember that song that we heard at church. And it brought so much reassurance or it brought so much um, hope in our hearts, right? Some of those songs, you guys have a favorite song that you sing whenever you guys are going through something? So even if you're suffering, if you're facing calamity, sing songs. And if you're cheerful, in prayer, thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this, you know, these potatoes that I have on my plate. Thank you for this salad that I'm eating today. Always thanking God for everything that He's given us. This is the communication that God wants to have in our lives. Even if everything is wonderful, everything's going the way that we would desire it to go, we are to be communicating with, with God. But he says in the latter part of 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. So many times we're reluctant, we're, we're reluctant to ask for prayer, right? Sometimes you feel, oh, this is just something that's going to pass. It's going to be okay. You know, I can handle it. I'm all right. You know, I'm, I'm good, you know. But he says if you're sick, and he's not just talking about the sniffles. He's not talking about the sore throat that we wake up with. But he's talking about a real sickness. The Greek word is asthuno, asthunio, which in this A prefix means being without strength. You're sick to the point where you can't get out of bed. You ever feel like that? Oh, you're just achy and everything, and you know, you're, you're just, you know, you can't get out of bed. This is the type of sick that this is talking about. If we're feeling like this, if we got this situation in our lives, he says, call on the elders. Get the pastor, you know? Get somebody to bring someone, someone over to lay hands on you. He says that they may anoint you. He says, let them pray over you, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This anointment, even in the olden days, was more of a medicinal. You know, that's ointment, where we get the word ointment, anointing somebody with oil. You know, nowadays we, we, you know, we, we think of it, and, and it, it is true in a sense that is the, the, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. You know, we are anointing somebody with oil. But back then it was anointment that they would put on them. It was an oil that, you know, would, would, would help them. And this is what they would, you know, pray over them and, and give them this ointment that was going to help heal them or whatever they were sick. He says, in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. In, in the commentaries, there's a lot to say about this. You know, the, it, it says that the prayer of faith, you know, it could be those that are coming to the Lord. The prayer of faith. I think Jesus Christ, you know, to forgive your sins and to come into your life, that that would be the prayer of faith. And that would save not only the sickness physically, but our sickness spiritually. You know, bringing us to a realization of our emptiness, of being apart from Christ, and how that is, in a sense, being sick. Because he then again says, and the Lord will raise him up in that day. That we will be there for the resurrection. That we will be there to spend our eternity with the Lord. So he says, if anybody is sick, you know, it, you know, it could mean, you know, some commentaries say that it could mean physically, and it could be spiritually. Because this faith that they pray, this faith, this prayer of faith, is not only going to save the sick, but it's going to raise him up in that day. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And that's why some of the commentaries really believe that, hey, this is that prayer of faith. You know, if there's any sins that you've committed, because that's one of the things that we pray for. Lord, if there's anything that I've done that's contrary to the Word of God, that I want to ask for forgiveness of those sins. And in order to have forgiveness, we need to come to the Lord and ask for that forgiveness, right? We can't just believe that God is just going to, you know what, uh, he knows my heart. You know, he wants us to come to him. He wants us to ask him within our hearts. And he wants us to be in confession, just as David was. You know, when David had sinned, he came to confess his sins to the Lord. Now, confession is a big thing, you know, and I don't think we have the time to get into it. Because sometimes it says, he says in this next portion, it says, Therefore, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. He says, The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. 
You know, so what does it mean to confess our sins? You know, David says, you know, to thee and thee only have I sinned, as he's praying to the Lord. But sometimes these sins that we commit against other people need to be confessed. Because many times we don't confess sins because we're going to be held accountable for those sins, right? Especially if it's the sin to somebody else. You know, because I might say right now, you know, Lord, just, uh, you know, forgive me for not being the Christian that I should be. You know, I might say it within a group of people. You know, but what I really was praying for is maybe I've been backbiting. Maybe I've been gossiping. Maybe I've been talking about Dave behind his back. And rather than just saying, hey, you know, just I haven't been the Christian that I should or I haven't been living the life I should, maybe I should really be going to Dave and confessing, hey, Dave, you know what? The reason why you lost that last job, that was me. I did it. I said something. You know? So sometimes confession is needed because many times if we just confess flippantly, we really don't want to change. We want to continue on in whatever sin it is. You know, it's just like that man that you know, went to the priest and says, you know what, I, I need to pray for forgiveness. You know, I stole the bag of potatoes. You know, can, I, can you pray for my forgiveness? And, or I want to ask for forgiveness. And the priest said, when he thought about it, he says, well, wait a second. No, no. We start over again. The man, the man went to the store owner and says, hey, you know, he goes, I want to ask for forgiveness. I stole two bags of potatoes from the store. And the man thought about it a while and he says, wait a second, I, I was only missing one bag of potatoes. And the, and the guy goes, well, it was so easy to steal. I want to go back later on and get another bag. So sometimes we confess our sins, but not with intention to quit. We just, you know, we want to just sort of, uh, to make ourselves feel good. So here he says, confess, and confessing our trespasses. And when he says trespasses, these are things that we have gone against somebody else. You know, you get those trespassing signs, that don't trespass in this property or else you'll be prosecuted. Well, it might be maybe trespassing, going, to, going into somebody else's whatever, life, property. But he says, confess these to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. And it says that this effective prayer, the King James Version reads the effectual fervent prayer, which is not that good of a translation because it's more of the effective prayer. It's the energized prayer. It's the working prayer. It's not the effectual, but the effective. It's the prayer that is continual. You know, it's just not, again, not that just that one time thing, praying for something, but really asking the Lord. And not just praying because you're praying, but asking with intention that he's going to answer that prayer. And then he gives another uh, illustration of this effective prayer, you know, this uh, effective prayer. And he talks about Elijah, you know, and we don't have time. Let me, let me read the, the scripture, but we don't have time to get into it. In James 5, 16, he says, The effective firm prayer of righteous men of ill accomplishes much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was just a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so as we looked at this word prayer, we see that it starts all the way from 13, all the way from 13 to 18. Prayer is mentioned in every single verse. And so we can see that James is talking to us about prayer and how important it is as he's getting ready to close up chapter 5. Now, if we go to Acts chapter 6, verse 4, we will see that in the early days of the ministry, the church was also established in prayer. And that's why it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, it says that we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Again, if we're feeling like our lives aren't very effective or even our ministries for some of us, some of the people that we may be witnessing to, it says that in Acts that they devoted themselves to prayer, which meant that they used, they utilized a certain amount of time a day, they utilized, whether it was a group prayer, whether it was a city, everybody praying on their own, but we need to devote our lives to prayer. And that's why earlier when we opened up, uh, when I talked about prayer for those who are unsaved, prayer for those family members that you may have that you would love to see come to the Lord. And you explain to them and you talk to them that they're still not coming, you know, here it says that the, uh, uh, the, the effectual or the effective, the energized prayer. And sometimes it, it needs a little bit more than prayer. You know, the, the Bible talks about the prayer and the fasting for certain things that need to be, you know, 
taken care of. But here James is just talking about, again, giving great illustration about perseverance for those who are believers, for those who have felt persecution, who are going through some tough times in your life, to remember that God is there. God is watching. God sees everything. God knows what's going on. And James is saying, the best thing that we can do, whether we're down and out, whether we're sick, whether we're going through calamity, is to communicate with our Father, to communicate with God. He's there, you know, with an open ear, hearing everything that we have to say to Him. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for James and his illustrations and his good, practical Christian, Christian, Christian living. And Lord, how we should act and react to situations, how should we should be living. And Lord, for some of us, Lord, we felt the attacks of the enemy. Lord, whether it's by flesh and blood, by our overseers and bosses and stuff, Lord, with some of us that experienced that, Lord, that we pray that we would be those that James is talking about, Lord, that would be persevering this, these situations, these circumstances within our lives, that we would be looking to you because we know that you are right there and you see what's going on. And you're going to comfort us during those times. But Lord, we pray for those that might be doing the persecuting. We pray that you would be with their hearts, that you would soften them, Lord, that they would be able to see you through us as we are being your examples, Lord as they see us with patience, as they see us with long-suffering, may we draw them to you. And Lord, we, we pray that we would be those that would always be in prayer. We thank you, Lord, again for this place. We thank you for what you're doing. And we just pray that you would continually teach us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.